Oh, hello everyone. It's really nice to be joining from this end. Would have loved to be there, but it's really cool to be here as well. My name is Anita Human, and um, I'm joining the call from Nigeria. I Today I'm going to be speaking on the topic, um, embracing accessibility in open source. So let me get my screen. So um, before we get into the section, a little bit about me. I am a software developer advocate and a technical writer at API 7. I'm also an open source advocate and I contribute to a number of open source communities like Layer 5 and Chaos and I also love cats. So yeah, that's all about me. Now let's get into the topic for today. Now when we're talking about accessibility, lots of times we uh, we um, our attention is drawn to either um, people with um, um, visibility um, challenges or hearing um, difficulties and all of that, but it actually goes far beyond that when it comes to accessibility. And then bringing accessibility to open source is like an even broader um, area because in open source, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we're looking at mostly either gender or um, personalities or location and all of that but we're going to discuss um, a, a more in-depth aspect of accessibility diversity and inclusion in open source as well in this section now um the world health organization has um recorded that over a billion persons in the world that's the world we are in today um has persons who are experiencing a form of disability and with this record it shows that one out of five women experience a form of disability in their life. And 46% of these persons are within the ages of 60 and above. And of course, we have like one out of 10 persons, uh, children also who experience visibility. And um, while building our website, very little or less attention is put towards um, catering for the needs of these persons on especially in open source because yes we i noticed that most open source software focus more on uh, getting the work done rather than how the users um actually experience this um software or this website while going through it and um, that's what we're going to be discussing during this section today during this um, topic we're going to be looking at what exactly accessibility is all about the types of disabilities that exist out there and how open source processes relate to adaptive accessibility software and why um, accessibility matters in open source exactly how web accessibility can be measured and um, how open source communities can improve on the accessibility for their softwares and how open source um, and the different open source accessibility tools that exist out there so well let's get to it already So um, to begin with, let's look at um, the definition of accessibility. Like I said earlier, several softwares that have been developed that are open source have the difficulties or the problems of um, accessibility. And um, how would you say that? <laughs> or why would I actually say that? And look, for instance, I've gone through a lot of um, websites that I know that this website solves a problem for the mass, is like for the greater good, of course. But then when you go through the website, you ask this question, was there a designer um, production phase of this um, project? Like that's always the first question I'll ask, was there a designer going through this? Because either the colors do not fit, the color contracts do not fit, um, or are not like suitable for the website, or the texts are not like visible for people to actually go through. So like all of these, are some of the challenges that I have experienced in open source softwares that I want to discuss on during this section. And of course, more and more companies are getting aware of the concept of um, accessibility. But when it comes to creating these softwares, it's more of um, it becomes a more difficult challenge for people. And although that most of these um, projects and um, softwares are developed to be accessible, it doesn't actually cater for all of the disabilities that exist out there. So accessibility is simply practicing or making your web website as many people as possible. And of course, we, tra we traditionally think of being of this 
to the aspect of only disability and practice how to make sites accessible, accessible and benefit other groups as well such as persons that use different devices persons that use um that their bandit bandwidth is not like steady or strong enough to support the website and all of that we also look at persons with it, um that are old or people that are either um, physically challenged and all of that so what actually makes a website or what can we see should exist on a website that would classify as accessible well, when developing a program, we should also, aside considering that we're going to have the mouse, the keyboard, and the monitor, which are the basic standards of a website, the users, the designer should also look out for the less conventional methods of building this. And uh, we're talking about um, these disabilities that I mentioned earlier, taking into cognizance or uh, um, uh, recognition all of these and putting um, into production or development of that um, particular project to make sure that these features are implemented. So it's not only fixing or solving the projects for, it's not only solving the problem for people all around the world. Of course, that's what open source is all about, bringing out code that's available for everyone, right? So these products are not only available for for everyone but they're also being able to be used by every single person from different parts of the world so what are the the types of disabilities that we're looking at now we have various types but now let me give a quick example with this um, diagram here now take this building for instance to be a library and of course let's take this library to be open source or an open source software now you're trying to access this open source software and like you can see the staircase is like the first thing you take note of. You have to walk. This is like the only entrance to this building, right? So now let's take it as an open source software. Imagine someone who is um, physically challenged and probably had an accident a day before and is not able to climb the staircase like a normal person would. This staircase is going to be a barrier for him. Now imagine someone who is physically um, challenged as well, who has um, difficulties with their vision and all of that getting being able to get through this staircase might also be a challenge for this kind of persons and also look at persons who are heavily pregnant for instance climbing this staircase might even be <laughs> another very tedious problem for them and so now as an open source software being able to assess this uh, entire building is not like it's not um, inclusive for everyone of course because most persons will have to like go through more stress than other persons just to um, enjoy or go um, assess all the features that this building has or all the books that exist in this library. So yes, that's basically what we're going to, we're talking about accessibility. So and there are different types of accessibility, of course. We have the, the vision disability. The vision disability is, um, this includes people with blindness or low level vision or color blindness and all of that. So any particular challenge that you might be experiencing that makes you not able to view content um, like um, other persons would, you, then we can actually consider that as a vision disability. And the World Health Organization has estimated that over 285 million persons actually um, have one or two visual impairments in the world. And this means that imagine you're developing your website and it doesn't take into um, recognition these 250, um, 285 million persons. And that's rather discouraging, don't you think? And we're also looking at um, the physical disabilities. And um, the percentage of adults with um, physical disabilities and functioning is about 16% of course, because accidents happen every day. It's not like something that is planned, but it just happens. And you might just be unfortunate to lose a finger or an entire arm or both arms or whichever one it is, but then it becomes a disability for you. And of course, it's a challenge for you. And this could be permanent. Um, it, it could either be a permanent disability or a temporal or a situational one. Now, if you look at this um, picture by the left here, this was get, gotten from the Microsoft um, Inclusive Design um, Toolkit that actually um, highlights different ways you can actually take um, into recognition in, um, inclusive design while developing or building your software. Now, you can see that it has the different 
different types of disabilities that could actually people go through. And it also gives the forms which these disabilities come in. Like I said, it could either be permanent, it could either be temporal or situational. For instance, the one with the physical disabilities, you could have like um, a one arm, which is permanent from a recent accident or not, or you could just have a little injury that affects your thumb and you're not able to use your, your keypad as or your keyboard as you would. For instance, I'm a technical writer. Imagine I have to like lose one finger right now. I don't know how that would make me feel because I'll most likely feel bad about it. But that would actually affect my typing definitely. And thanks to a feature that um, Google Doc has that you can actually read out the text you want to write, I can use that in a situation like that to type out my text without having to use my keyboard, which is really, really awesome for looking out for persons who experience physical disabilities or such. Then we're also looking at another type of disability, which is the cognitive disability. Now, this is um, this talks about your ability to actually understand, understand things. And this, we're looking at, in this situation, we're looking at people that either have um, difficulties reading text as it should be, or... Um, so, I actually experience it sometimes when I, I see like a sentence that's very, very long and then I start from the last word to read the um, first word. I don't know how that happens, but because the text gets too long, so I have to look for the shortest way to understand it. And so many persons experience this and it's actually more difficult for some persons to actually read text like this. So if you have a website that has very tiny text that does not support for either maximizing the text or zooming in, it will be difficult for persons who experience this type of um, disabilities, of course. Or let's say your, your website provides only very technical terms and persons are not able to like digest your contents properly. And this would be a disability for them as well. Then we also have the literacy disability. And this is for persons who are not able to read or cannot read, let's say little children, for instance, or elderly persons who are, or even illiterate, persons who are not able to like go through school to understand how to read and write. So now this is, can be a disability. It is not like the very, the other disabilities where you have to lose a, a part of the body, but then it affects them in a way because if you're not able to read, you definitely not feel excited about that. And um, we also have the hearing impairments for persons who have one hearing challenge or another. Now, various people have various levels of um, hearing losses, and this can range from the mild to the profound cases. And according to World Health Organization, about four, um, 466 million persons in the world experience hearing disabilities. Now, that's to show you that your website that you developed that does not support um, translating text into audio is not actually favoring these people. And you can imagine four, 466 million persons not being able to accept, assess your website like um, other persons would. Now that is not rather an exciting thing to, for me to say as a user or as a, a developer, of course. Now let's move forward to how does, um, how do these um, accessibility or these how does open source relate to these adaptive accessibility softwares? Now, in open source, we're talking about code that is um, made accessible and available to all. Now, some of uh, open source core principles that actually take note of these um, are the, um, there are quite a number of these, but I'm going to highlight just a few. You see that there is actually a lap, an overlap between open source and the principles, and also what accessibility um, standards are trying to achieve. One of which is um, community. For instance, in open source, we always try to um, prioritize community because without the community, the code won't exist, and without the code, um, or without the support of the community, of course, the code will not like be sustained. And of course, that's what accessibility is trying to do, bring, um, develop softwares that are available for the common good or accessible to every single person, which includes the community, of course. And then we also look at transparency. Now, whether you're developing software or solving a business problem, we all, ha we all have access to the information and materials, and people need inf um, access to this information. So imagine where 
I'm not able to access a particular information on your website because of my disability or something like that. And that doesn't actually achieve the goal or the purpose of transparency at all, does it? Now, another um, thing that overlaps between accessibility and um, open source, we look at empathy. Now, open source projects are built to serve the greater good. Now, that and that exactly what accessibility is also looking to achieve, to develop projects that not only is going to be used by everybody, but then solves the problems of every single person that comes across this project. And of course, open source also looked at within this same direction. And so you can see how those two over, um, overlap against each other as well. And finally, we're going to be looking at um, inclusion. Open source and adaptive software consider inclusion as a priority. And when I'm talking about adaptive software, I'm talking about um, softwares that prioritize accessibility. Now we're talking, uh, they consider um, inclusion as a priority. And so when planning a project, we're often expected to consider inclusive designs, of course, look beyond just designing to, you know, solve a problem, but then solve a problem for every single person. And when we're talking about every single person, we're talking about persons that are perfectly okay and persons that are physically challenged or experiencing one disability or another. Now, this means that the product is going to serve a vast array of user spectrum. So it doesn't have to be just um, people from different regions of the world or people that speak different languages anymore or people that um, have different sexual orientations anymore. We're looking beyond all of that. We're looking at people that either, are, for instance, you're trying to use a software that, um, you're trying to use a software and only for you to realize that um, you have vision impairment and the, the software colors do not align with you. Let's say you're looking at the software and then you can't actually read the text because the color contrast that is used for that particular software is disturbing to your vision. And that would actually be disturbing, right? So in open source, we're trying to be inclusive with all of this to build websites that not only are going to be used by people from different parts of the world, but then people that have some, um, some challenges like ADHD, autism, or hearing aids and vision impairments can actually benefit from this software equally like normal persons would. And so why does um, accessibility matter exactly in open source? Let's look at that. For several reasons, you might be wondering if open source softwares do not already take um, into recognition accessibility. But I don't think that is actually completely true because majority of open source softwares right now focus on let this software fix this problem. Yes, the technicalities and the development part of that uh, software might be in order, but then let's look beyond the the purpose or the problem that software is trying to fix. Let's look at the, the persons that this software is going to serve. So now why does accessibility matter in open source? First and foremost, we're looking at outreach. Like I said, um, I highlighted earlier that 15 billion persons, sorry, 1 billion persons in the world are actually disabled. That's 15% of the world's population. Now imagine that 15 billion persons are not able to use your software. Now for a product that is just starting up, imagine you lose 15 billion persons being able to use your software because um, you didn't consider accessibility during the development phase, but then you considered it probably because someone brought up an issue or reported your site to um, st all, all of the legislative bodies um, as responsible for accessibility and all of that. So now you're only hindering your progress from your project from reaching a vast um, number of persons. And of course, it's going to affect the development of that particular project. Now, open source software is also um, care about um, accessibility because of diversity and inclusion. And this, if you 
if you've gone through open source, you'll see that it is a priority. There are several uh, bodies that actually exist that are responsible for taking care of um, or measuring or tracking the diversity, equity, and inclusion in open source, one of which is the Chaos Foundation that I'm a member of. So as Chaos, we've developed some um, metrics and analytics that can be helped to measure open source softwares, open source events, and see how um, how they actually support diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of the metrics we, we take like into key, we put so much attention into is accessibility. Now this is because a lot of persons bring their comment. You might not hear them tell you directly, but people always have like one one say or the other about an event that they attended that was not accessible or a website that they used that was not accessible or didn't favor the particular disability and that is wrong now i also draw a quick um attention back to the twitter audio um, feature that was re re released some time back now, if you notice that feature was was meant to be the feature i mean when you when you think of, yeah, this is something new, uh, the world will benefit from this, it was meant to be that kind of feature. But then several persons were disadvantaged by the introduction of that feature. Imagine I dropped a long audio of five minutes and then like lots of persons on my timeline are not able to read or hear that particular audio because of course they have some hearing impairment or something like that. And that actually didn't take, that is not taking into recognition, diversity, and inclusion at all. So at Chaos, we try to track all of this and make sure that a project or an event prioritizes these uh, metrics like um, accessibility to make sure that it is in order before we can consider this project or this um, event diverse and inclusive. And that, because diversity and inclusion are priority, um, like the key principles of open source. We try to keep these standards as um, effective as possible. And then we're also looking at the project sustainability. Now, when we're talking about a project sustainability, due to how fast technologies are advancing, several projects are now seeing the relevance or actually adopting the need for accessibility for their products. And this is because so many um, reports have been made to the legislative bodies about a product not being um, not being accessible, so many persons are learning from the mistakes of other softwares. Now, like I said, in the case of Twitter, there were several reports that were dropped about that particular feature, and then we got a feedback from Twitter saying they're going to like ratify that, but not so much was done afterwards. But a lot of organizations have tried to you know learn from mistakes like this to implement it in their software to make sure they don't also get like sued for not being able to meet the accessibility of this. And um, imagine you actually, your project does not follow up with these trends. Your project does not actually take into recognition all of this and still doesn't support accessibility. After all of the softwares around or all of the softwares that we're used to have adopted this. This only means that people will slowly, um, your, your project or your software will slowly become obsolete and a lot of persons who don't actually see the need to either contribute to it or to um, tell another person about no matter how effective that project solves the problem, if it doesn't solve the problem for the entire, um, for the larger spectrum, then not a lot of persons would refer that. Personally, I know I wouldn't refer a project that does not solve a problem for me in one way or another to another person. And I know so many other, so many persons would do the same. So imagine that affecting the sustainability of your open source project. And um, we're also looking at the more people benefit. Now, by designing a project for someone with um, a permanent disability, someone that is actually experiencing maybe a situational disability, let's say I, I um, lost my finger, like the example I gave earlier, I lost my finger, but then thanks to the feature with um, being able to type text with audio, I'm able to actually benefit that. Although I'm not like permanently disabled, I was able to benefit from this. So like looking at the fact that not only are people with disabilities going to benefit from this, other persons too are also going to benefit from this. For instance, being um, a, a, mom, a mother that just gave birth to a child and is trying to, you know, breastfeed the child and also 
use a system or a phone, for instance. There might be so much for her to handle at, with her both hands, of course. So um, having features that actually allow you flexibly use your software or without even while your hands are occupied, it's going to play a major role for not only persons with disabilities. Now you can see how that affects the larger the larger population and not just the minorities that are affected by these disabilities. And then we're also looking at um, the emotional context of it. Now, as a user or as a contributor, I can see that um, if I use a particular open source tool and the design is accessible, and I find the design accessible, I would definitely, I definitely see the need to, you know, tell or spread the word about that particular product. Now I'm going to say the best things about that particular product and the features that I, I encountered on that particular product. And do you know how happy that made me feel? Exactly. So imagine how many persons the product is satisfying by just fulfilling the um, need for um, accessibility. And also, why another thing to also take into consideration is the legislative bodies that are responsible for this. Of course, we have like several le legislative bodies that are coming up to track and monitor accessibility all around the world, particularly for our websites. And so, not um, avoiding the being sued by these um, by disabled persons or persons with disabilities to, to these um, legislative bodies would save your product a lot more harm. And that is also a thing to take into recognition. So how can web accessibility be measured? There are um, different ways you can actually address um, or test the accessibility of your website or your software. You can do this manually or automatically. There are several open source tools that you can actually implement and use automatically without having to write too much code to test the accessibility for your website. Or you can actually do this manually by developing the code to um, check all of this during the testing phase. But yeah, using the automatic one saves a lot of stress. And you can do this by following the standards that are set by the W3 processes and um, the um, Web Accessibility Initiative. So these two um, bodies came together to form these standards that you see down here. We're talking about the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, the um, Authoring to Accessibility Guidelines, and the User Agent Accessibility Guidelines. Now, so the Web... Um, Content Accessibility Guidelines explains how you can make your website more accessible to people with um, disabilities. Now, this has like three, it has been updated into three phases so far. I think the last was 2018. The first was just to have the basic standards of a website, let your website be able to be used by a mouse and the keyboard and then the um, navigations on your keyboard and all of that then the second version was where they had realized that it's not this is not actually addressed all the accessibility challenges and then we um, we had to take into recognition the um hearing aids the the speaking the speech and all of that and implement it and so this web content accessibility guidelines caters for all of that and then looking at the authoring to accessibility guidelines it explains how you can how to make the authoring tools themselves accessible and this authoring tools so that people with disabilities can create web content and help authors create more web content and this focuses particularly for persons that are building this website or contributing to this website, you know, all of these tools to help these persons achieve an accessible website. And then we're also looking at the, the user agent accessibility guidelines. And these guidelines explain how users can, um, how to make user agents such as um, your browser or your media player accessible to people. Like I, um, a quick example is being using VLC in a public place or trying to use your VLC in a public place. Of course, you're not um, you're not ch um, physically challenged in any way. You don't have any form of disabilities, but because of the situation that you find yourself in, the noise might not allow you to hear all of that. And that is where you see most, um, most of these media players support um, 
audio translations and subtitles so you can read the, the content that is being said without actually having to stress your your hear, your ears just hear what is being said in that particular audio you're trying to play in public and there are three standards that follow the uh, main this um there are three um principles that follow these um, accessibility standards they're they're given the acronym poor now this the P stands for um, perceivable. Now we're talking about your website being your content being able to make sense to all the users. Like I said earlier, most persons are not like literate. They're not. They don't have the privilege of being educated, and so they might not be able to read your content and um, understand it to the best of their of their abilities. So. Does your website provide content that is perceivable to these persons as well? Does it solve their needs? It, does it actually provide information that these persons can also learn from? And also, we're looking at operable. Once um, one can say that the site is operable if a user is able to navigate the site easily. So, um, how are the users able to actually go through your site, find different places? So. Um, I'm going to draw an attention to this. I've come across a lot of open source projects that although they have like so many content on the website, I mean so many, I mean like a detail, like there's so much detail that you'll be scared about the, uh, on the detail that you're seeing on the website. The details are not like easily accessible. Now, if I'm looking for an area under a particular, how to set up that particular um, website, I have to like ask someone who is more, um, experience that particular tool or something like that or do a lot of googling and that is a challenge as well so your website is expected to be operable in the most easy and efficient way possible and then we also have understandable which uh, stands for your projects being able to be understood understood by several persons by several persons and users and we're looking at the spectrum from persons who are experiencing um adhd or like um being able to digest content fast of course we know that some persons digest content faster than other persons but then it's your website does your website provide um resources that can actually be digested by these persons in the best ways possible and this is what this principle is talking about and then we finally we have the robust so does your website supports all of the technologies the before i changed my system to this particular one i was using an old mac and so when, whenever i tried to run um softwares like docker or kubernetes on it throughout that day my system would be hitting like i put it in the microwave or something like it would be so hot and i might not be able to do any other major tasks because my system would um, slow every single thing i'm doing down being able to swipe left or swipe right became so difficult. And so if your software does not support um, persons who use either old devices that um, it's not um, reliable on old devices or they're in areas where the um, network provision is not as steady as um, as solid as in other places, all of that needs to be taken into recognition. And that's what this principle is um, focusing on. So how can um, open source communities improve these accessibilities in software development? So um, accessibility is not, of course, I've um, highlighted how a lot of persons have um, heard and discussed accessibility do, um, during their production phase at all. Of course, it's not a new thing in the um, into software engineering. So many developers are familiar with the concept of accessibility, building accessible websites. So many persons have spoken about this at conferences, written articles on the relevance of accessibility for a website. But then the major problem is um, being able to prioritize this for each open source software that exists out there because we know that so many open source softwares today do not actually support um, accessibility for most of the um, disabilities that, me that we mentioned earlier and even more that were not probably mentioned. And so how can open source improve on, this, um, on the accessibility of these softwares? And first is to recognize exclusion.
Now, accessibility is rarely taught as um, a fundamental skill in engineering or, des or designing schools. And yet, accessibility um, is um, a technology that is needed for every techno every software or um, tool that you're building. And you might um, be able to spot the different, you might not be able to spot um, the different biases as an individual who is not experiencing any form of difficulties. You might not be able to highlight or spot this um, this accessibility uh, challenges, but someone who actually experienced, who has experienced this, will tell you that I went through this particular software and I can tell you it wasn't accessible. And so by working closely with um, excluded members in the community, of course, we're talking about open source. So there are definitely persons amongst us who uh, um, who are actually going through one or two of these um, disabilities. Now, working closely with these persons will help us identify the exclusion that has been given to these persons. Now, just like when we, um, the concept of diversity and inclusion was very new in open source, most persons were like, they're not taking, their skills are not prioritized, like um, the design, for instance. I know so many websites were developed back in the day without the design insight. So like design was like the last phase of thinking when it comes to building more softwares. And so when you see the software, it's it solves the problem quite all right, but then the design does not look like it's going to solve the problem because the design either looks very, very shitty in one way or another. And so recognizing, bringing these persons that have been excluded biasly into the team in the in the planning um, stage of these softwares will be a good place to actually recognize these exclusions that exist on our open source softwares and also thinking uh, inclusively by thinking inclusive we're talking about mm -hmm. not only not only looking at um, the inclusion of gender or the inclusion of location or the inclusion of of race and all of that, we're looking at inclusion on the accessible end. Now, your website is available, yes, it solves a pro it's meant to solve a problem for the mass, yes, but then how about the minorities that are disabled? How about the 15% um, of the world population that are not able to ass assess your website comfortably? And do they also achieve this? Now, when you think or when you look back to this, you'll be able to understand how um, and the best ways you can actually approach this. Now, another way you can actually address or improve the accessibility of your open source software is to implement inclusive designs, like I said, it's one thing to um, develop a, a product that solves a problem, but then it's one thing to actually see that it solves a problem for all. And so improving these uh, inclusive designs by bringing um, persons that have the experience. There are lots of persons that actually specialize on disabilities and um, accessibility features for websites. So bringing these persons towards the, the planning or design phase of your website or the designers having an insight on or an idea of what accessibility or the importance of accessibility in a particular website would be a great place to actually start when implementing this design in an accessible manner. And also learn from the um, difference and the diversities by considering the vast number of users and contributor spectrum. So how many persons are using this software, for instance? The entire world, of course, is open source. So like when you're building, you know that you're not the only person who is going to be using this. You're not the only person who's going to be contributing this. So now learn from the vast number of persons that are going to be coming through this. And this means you need fresh and diverse perspective every single day while planning this particular software. Now to work together and to reach out to even persons that you you're aware that yes, they have more experience with this. So like bringing this diverse perspective would be a great place to also get, um, address this um, vast range of um, contributor and user spectrums. And also thinking globally. And by thinking globally, I mean, just like the other points that I mentioned earlier, it's going to solve the problem for the entire world. Now, people think differently. People see things differently. The way your network or your internet might work on your end 
or your part of the world might not be the same way it's work on my part of the world. Because I know there are days when I jump on meetings like this, now, not until I recently upgraded to like the best internet providers that I'm aware of. If I get on calls like this, I'll be sounding like a robot most times. And it can be really, really crazy. And so when you're building softwares, you should consider that there are regions in the world that the network might not be as solid as, or like they don't actually have access to these tools. Okay, um, I recently joined a new team. For instance, I recently joined a new team and um, we had the difficulty of using Google Meet because some persons do not have the privilege of using Google Meet in their location. So that was a, a very difficult thing for us to communicate as a team. And so when you're building your software, you should not only think of the region of the developers or the region which the, the teammates are in, but you should think globally on different ends of the world what if this goes to, you know, if there's something called the, the end of the world, yes. What if there's someone at the end of the world who is going to be using this? How are they going to benefit from my software? So, like, try thinking dev, um, globally as a team or as an open source community um, when working towards building an accessible software. And also enforcements. Now, we've read about this, we've advocated about accessibility. It exists in most of the documentation that you read about open source softwares. But it's one thing to write about things, it's one thing to speak about things, and it's another thing to practice it. So, like, try to instill this concept of accessibility as a priority amongst the teammates, amongst the contributors, amongst members of the community. And so every single person that comes into this project or comes to work to, about on this particular project to know that even if I'm bringing a feature, I should consider persons that are going through one disability or another, and this project should solve the, um, the problem for them as well. And so when every single person on the team has the concept or believes in the idea of accessibility, it will be a lot easier to actually enforce this and achieve the, the accessibility for your website. And then using um, automated accessibility testing tools, like I said, there are quite a number of those out there that you don't have to like develop these manually. You can just get your website, put the link there, and then run it, and it will tell you if your website is accessible in one way or the other. So it depends on which accessibility you're focusing on, but it's always advised to focus on the different spectrums that exist. Because like I have been saying, the users are going to be your users might be at the end of the world, so you should think of persons that are on the end of the world as well. And so, here are some of the open source assistive and um, accessibility um, softwares and tools that exist. Now, several um, projects have tried to implement the concept of um, accessibility, several open source projects. But of course, this is not a thing or a, a goal that is going to be achieved overnight. But then we also have some of these assistive tools to help you through, like the, the Venus, a product by Linux that is going to help um, that's optimized for users with visual, um, visual impairments. So you could actually use this and introduce it to your open source community and developers as well. Then we have um, the auto hotkeys, of course, for persons who have um, the mouse click and all, you can also work with that. While trying to set up this slide, I got an email that there's this uh, software I was supposed to install on my phone to help me navigate with my slide. And that is actually a very brilliant one because imagine you're not able to use your system for everything. Being able to actually use softwares like that to navigate with um, your phone is will be a good thing to consider and think about. So like that's also one as assisted tool you can look at. And then um, the Mulberry symbol set, which is also the, um, another tool that focuses on pictographs and symbols, making sure that um, this, um, your devices provide graphic information in the best ways possible. So, um, okay, this picture is not there as I expected it to, but what the yes, um, I'm about to uh, I'm about to round off. <laughs> Yes, so um, while developing your website, you should um, get yourself out of the picture of um, 
the developer or the engineer and look from the user's end. So if I'm a user and I have, I unfortunately experienced an accident today, will your software or will your open source software still serve the purpose that I need it to? Or if I um, unfortunately lose my site today, will it actually fix this problem for me? Will I be able to use this software just like I've been using it on other days? Now, this I'm going to leave this with a quick quote from um, Tim Berners, the inventor of the World Wide Web, which says the power of the web is in its universality. And so access to every single person, regardless of their disability, is an essential aspect. And so we're not just building softwares that there are going to be lots of contributors to come and implement their code and go away. But then we're looking at a more global end where we're fixing problems for each and every single one of these persons coming in, regardless of their disabilities. And so if there are any questions right now, Adam, take them. And um, if not, thank you so much for your time. It was really great um, sharing these and also learning more about this during my preparation process as well. You can also contact me on Twitter and um, you can reach out to me via email or even my website at anitaehuman.dev. Thank you very much.